Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Shots Fired Podcast. I am Mark Redlich. And I'm Kyle Schoberg. And today, guys, uh, this is going to be an awesome interview. We're actually really excited about this one. We went and snagged the sniper instructor here at the TAC Ops Conference, where we currently are. As you guys can see, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, different background studio. Uh, we are here at the TAC Ops Conference in New York. Awesome event. If you guys haven't gone to one, go to SWATConference.org check them out. There's three conferences a year, Nashville, New York, and Washington, D.C. And Mark and I are going to be at all three instructing as well as bringing the podcast to the uh, event. So you guys, it's an awesome, awesome event. I'm thoroughly impressed with the way they do, they do these. Yeah, this is very impressive. I can't wait for the Nashville one. That yep. one's coming up next. Yeah. So, Hey, we were lucky enough. You guys all like the SWAT interviews that we do. You guys asked for more of it. So we were fortunate enough, uh, to snag Charles Mosier from Las Vegas Metro SWAT team. who's here teaching the sniper courses for them. And Charles has had an amazing career yeah. and we were just talking off camera about it. Um, I'm amazed and I know we're going to learn a lot from this and I know you guys are too. So I'm going to turn it over to Charles. Charles can introduce yourself. What are the classes you're teaching here? And then we'll, uh, we'll kick this off. Well, first, thanks for having me guys. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm here teaching some of the cyber classes. So I try to switch them up every year. So guys are getting a fresh look at something different that maybe they haven't seen. Mm -hmm. Um, I come from a large agency where our op tempo is extremely high. Um, depending on who you talk to, we're one of the top teams in the country. Um, we're a full-time SWAT team with, when I started out, we had 25 operators and now I think it's up to somewhere close to 40, depending on attrition, might be down to like 34, 35 guys. So it's a big team, a lot of operators, but there's a lot of experience that happens there. Yeah. Um, because it's Vegas, there's a lot of crazy that goes on yeah, there. And yeah. so you see a lot more in a short period of time. Um, I think we average somewhere right between three or 400 um, high research warrants a year, somewhere right around 50 to 80 um, call outs and probably somewhere right around 20 hostage rescues every year. Wow. That's an incredibly so, busy team. Yeah. It, that's just the work side. Now, then you throw in the training, we teach, uh, a SWAT school. Um, so we have a SWAT school that we host and then we also do, um, a sniper course there, um, as well. So you're always, busy. always, always working. Yeah. yeah. And you're on all the time. Well, that's, that's that does, hard. It, yeah, it goes to the credibility of like, yeah, you guys are, I would definitely say one of the top SWAT teams. And that's why, you know, you guys offer those trainings and people send their cops to go to your trainings because they trust you guys and the, yep. the knowledge that you're giving them. You know, that's, that speaks volume. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of it is the credit to the guys who came before my generation. Yeah. So guys like Kevin McCord, um, Dave Reed, Manny Rivera, all the legends of Metro SWAT, um, Larry Burns, they were the ones who laid that foundation of that operational standard that the guys had. And then that kind of is is how the guys do the job today. There's a very high expectation for everyone in that unit. And the good part is I would say, I don't think that I've worked with a guy who didn't hold that standard to a degree mm -hmm. um, because the expectations there and, and, and you're held in pretty high esteem on the agency. And, and so, yeah. you know, who wants to suck at their job? Nobody, yeah. Yeah. right? So when you come in and there's that high expectation, some people go, oh, it's not, it's not, it's not fair, it's not realistic. And I just say, hey, embrace it and just step into that role. And, you know, especially when it comes to SWAT guys or even cops, remember this, you become a police officer and then every, all your friends that you used to know said what? Hey, let, uh, tell me about the guns. You, now all of a sudden you're a ballistic yeah. gun expert. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, I don't know shit. I just got this gun issue. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know nothing. <laughs> you're an expert. You know? <laughs> and a gun nut. <laughs> so, um, but like you'd said, I've had an unbelievable career. Um, the blessing started um, really young. So I grew up in a Marine Corps family. And one of the things that inspired me um, was the fact that my dad always told me, Charlie, when you turn 18, I'm going to run you down to the Marine Corps and they're going to make a man out of you. Oh, man. And that just scared the shit right out of yeah, me. Yeah, I right? can imagine being I was like, I am not going to do that. <laughs> um, so my parents got a divorce when I was 16 years old. Um, kind of how that played out was I wanted to learn how to scuba dive. So I took that opportunity um, to learn how to scuba dive on the base there. Turns out the instructor is a SEAL Team 1 guy by the name of Terry. And so Terry liked me, saw something in me, and he started, he planted a seed of something that you can do. And he said, 
this is something you can do. And he told me about these Navy SEALs and I'm like, I don't even know what that is. I, I was like, CBs? He's like, no. CBs, no, not at all. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is what Navy SEALs no do. And he explains it to me. And then he, he pulls me aside. We're hanging out. After I get my certificate and everything, I get certified. We go on a couple of dives in La Jolla, Sh in La Jolla Shores together. And he, he pulls me aside and he shows me these pictures that he has from an op that he did um, off, of, um, off of the coast of... Um, oh, it was off of Tripoli, but I'm trying to think of the the country there. Um, we'll say, we'll, we'll just say that, uh, it's so top secret. You can't say, even <laughs> though you secretly <laughs> forgot, you know, it's secret. It's, it's called black ops, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the black ops. He couldn't, yeah. but anyway, so he, so he shows me these pictures and they blew up some oil derricks off the coast of this country. And, um, I was like, wow, dude, the story just blew my mind. Like they pay people to do that. Hmm. And I just thought it was the coolest shit. So, I go on, I started working on a sport fishing boat as a kid. Um, me and this kid, Chris Markoff, we became very good friends. Um, we start working on sport fishing boats. Uh, later on, we get our captain's license and everything. So uh, I was in a relationship, that relationship ended, and I came to the realization if I was gonna try to do the Navy SEAL thing, this was the only opportunity I was gonna get. So I'm having lunch with my dad, and I tell my dad I wanna be a Navy SEAL, and he said, I don't think you're gonna make it. Mm. Um, you got bad knees because I was a wrestler and I played football in high school. So I'd suffered many knee injury, you know, which is just kind of part of playing sports. But he goes, I don't think you'll make it because of your knees. I've seen that training out there in Coronado. It's intense. And as a young person, you don't know what intense is yet. Yeah. I thought football or wrestling practice and wrestling practice, you know, you go in there and the walls are dripping sweat. Yeah. You know, you think that's pretty intense. And you're like, I think I got this. You know, how hard can it be? Right. And then I got there. And so when I told him I want to be a Navy SEAL, he was kind of shocked, um, made that comment to me and it lit a fire that still burns to this day. And it's one like this, don't ever tell me what I can't do yeah. because I'll prove to you that I can. Yeah. I could be 500 pounds overweight. And if you told me I couldn't run a marathon, just my personality type is one like, oh really? Well, let me show you. Yeah. And then I will do what I gotta do to get it done. And so that lit that fire. Um, so I show up to Coronado, yeah, how old? How old? I was 20 years old. 20. So I show up, uh, I'm 20 years old, um, and Bud starts. And so the first thing is they shave your heads. And so I made friends with some guys who are about my size. There's a guy, Mark Hawes, great dude. Um, he ended up retiring, and there's some funny similarities there. But so on day one of training, the first day I'm there, we're at the pool, and they spray you down with water so you're freezing, and you're, you're on these bleachers sitting there waiting for the evolution, waiting for the instructors. And I'm freezing my ass off and I'm I shivering. I, started I literally <laughs> weighed like 170 pounds. I'm like, what's going on? This is just so bad. And I looked over and I see this other skinny guy about my size. I said, hey, come here. So he scoots over and next thing you know, we're huddling up and I'm like, hey, what's your name? I'm Mark, I'm Charles. And then we developed this friendship. And the interesting <laughs> thing about, about the training was all of those guys I became friends with, everyone made it. No the guys who didn't make the personal connections didn't make it. And oh, wow. I found that interesting looking back on it, like Dave Tapper. Dave Tapper was an amazing individual, freaking him and Greg Patterson showed up to Buds together <clears throat> from New Jersey. And Dave um, went on a swim, one of the swims in first phase, and he failed to swim. And so Chief, this guy, Chief Mwaganatia, um, giant Samoan dude, right? Just, he's one of those guys, he walks in the room and, all right. Oh, Charles, Sorry about he's that. getting paged. Yeah, look. Wow. D didn't get the silence. Wow. Oh. Totally ruined the no, whole thing. Just starting kidding. over. Uh, well, welcome, answer it, dude. Uh, no. <laughs> welcome just, back, everyone, nope. to another episode. <laughs> yeah. Here we go again, starting yeah. over. No, no, go ahead. So this guy, Chief Morgan, he is the type of individual when he walks into a room, you instantly, you know that he's there because he's huge. And then secondly, he has that look on his face like, He's, he's registering you're there, but he's looking like into your soul. He's one of those people you go, oh shit, let me just make sure I stand up straight next to this guy. So anyway, he comes to me and he says, he says, so here's the deal. You're now tap or swim buddy. And if you fail, you're both out. And oh, I was shit. like, well, that ain't fair. Oh, you know, and it ain't nothing fair. You, if you fail, you're both out. And I just told Dave, I said, listen, we're never gonna fail a swim. Yeah. And there were times where on these swims, I'm swimming as hard as I could. I've got him by his, by his um, UDT life jacket and I'm pulling him 
in the water and we're finning as hard as we could. And we would make the times by like a minute, 30 seconds. And that happened from first phase all the way through the end of third phase. Oh, man. And so you're doing, you're not doing like a 50 yard swim. This is miles in the ocean, open ocean with fins and a mask and we're side stroking and we're just swimming our butts off. And so anyway, th that's my relationship with Dave Tapper. We were swim buddies all the way through buds, love the guy, um, would do anything for him. And anyway, he went to SEAL Team 3, I went to SEAL Team 5. Mark Hawes, who was, like I told you, we became good friends, he was in my boat crew. Um, we were the winning boat crew in Hell Week, not like that means anything, but it helps in, in, in some of the relationship stuff. Like you see a buddy, he's under the boat, he's in the number two position and he's suffering. You know, It takes a lot to slide in behind the guy and take some of that weight off of him, mm -hmm. right? And so those are, the, those are the relationships. And that's why like a lot of SEAL team guys are super tight because you go through that suffering together and you know what it is. So when a guy says, oh, I graduated buds, you go, okay, I got some respect for you because I know what that hurt is. Yeah. You know, laying in the water and the instructor pulls out a chart and it's just a mind game, but he pulls out this paper and it looks like a chart and he's like, tell me what the water temperature is. And they'll tell you, oh, 47 degrees. You know, the guy will just blurt out some, some temperature and he looks like he's looking at the chart and he goes, we got six hours. We can be here for six hours, man. Oh, man. And you're like, six hours? Holy shit, I'm gonna die. And yeah. that's that's the thought process that starts. So they start working on you mentally through the physical pain. Um, so that goes on, uh, graduate buds, um, go to SEAL Team 5. Uh, I spend six years in the SEAL teams there. Greatest experience of my life, oh, well, one of them. Um, I will admit that you know, being on a tactical team, a local tactical team where you get to go home to your family every night, I think is probably one next, uh, is the next level up. Operationally, you know, the operations are different, yeah. um, you know, because you're on a global scale. So it's different in that aspect, but you know, you're not doing a lot of hostage rescues uh, as a Navy SEAL yeah. or even as a tier three asset. And I don't want to get into all that stuff, but you know, there's different levels of assets that the government has and the irregular SEAL platoons don't do a whole lot of hostage rescue. You know, it depends on where everyone else is at and what's going on in the world. And you may be forced to do it, but that's not the first option. If you're on a local SWAT team, you are the hostage rescue team. Yeah, you're it. There's no one else they're gonna call, mm -hmm. you know? And when you look at, you know, and, and, and I want people to take this the wrong way, but when you look at local <clears throat> SWAT teams comparatively to most of the FBI SWAT teams, you have a greater leeway in tools that you can use and tactics you can use compared to, lead to, they, to, to them. Because all their tactics are developed in Quantico. So they've got to go off of whatever Quantico says where you guys can adapt into the field. You know, you do a, you do a training uh, segment with let's say some, some Delta guys who come to town and they go, hey, we use this explosive charge and it works like this. You do a little bit of training, you go, hey boss, I think this charge is probably better than what we are using, let's adopt that. And then you make the change. Yeah, right. That's not how that works for them. It has to be vetted through their guys. Um, and it's a long process for them. So local SWAT teams generally, um, in my opinion, I think are operationally better than some of those teams that people would hold in higher esteem. Yeah, like, makes sense. I'm on an FBI SWAT team and you just go, okay, I, I understand yeah. that. And that's great, good. <laughs> Same team, but, <laughs> different. Mm, you know. Yeah, no, nah, it yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure guys want to hear a little bit of, um, you know, your, your SEAL career. I'm, I'm kind of curious. So what was it like getting on the onto the teams um how old are you so i like i said i was 20 years old um and the process started back then there wasn't a whole lot of information out there so today it's a longer process the kids i want to say it's more like a two-year pipeline to go from i want to be a navy seal to getting a trident mm -hmm. Um, back in those days, you said you wanted to be a Navy SEAL. They're like, okay, quick, get the guy on the plane and ship him off to, to boot camp before he changes his mind. You know, yeah. nowadays they're like, no, we've got 200 spots. We're gonna find the 200 fittest guys in the country and you can compete for a contract. And if you get that contract, then maybe we'll consider sending you off Jeez. to do that. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, very, it, it's very competitive comparatively to what it was before. Yeah. Now here's the interesting fact even though it's more competitive and they're probably getting a, a higher quality candidate, yeah. the attrition rate is the same. That's about an 80% washout rate. Yeah. So you just say, okay, well, and it's interesting when I, I talk to, especially like psychologists or people who, who study the SEAL program and those kind of things, they still can't put their finger on what exactly is it in a person that pushes them through? Why are they that 20% that will excel 
or, or not fall to the adversity? And then why does 80% fall to the adversity? I mean, they're still high quality athletes. I mean, I was in buds with guys who literally stepped off. They looked like they stepped off the pages of muscle and fitness. And here I am, I weighed 170 pounds soaking wet. You know, I, the hardest thing I did up to that point was freaking wrestling practice, yeah. you know? <laughs> and you just go, eh, well, yeah. like outside of getting injured, probably like, you know, you're talking about like guys that are quitting, Ment- like just mentally can't handle it and want to quit. Yep, the pressure. Yeah. And so there are some things that I think work against some guys compared to the others. So what I found is the larger the athlete, so the more muscle mass, mm-hmm. the faster he's gonna burn out. And SEAL training is all endurance based, right? You're not in there doing uh-huh. bench press, you're doing push-ups all day long, yeah. right? You're not, you know, when you go, when you're doing PT out on the grinder, you know, if you, <clears throat> depending on the instructor, you may have to put on a dive belt with maybe 10, 15, 20 pounds on it to do a couple pull-ups. There was one guy, um, Lance Cummings, the dude to this day sticks out in my mind. We went in there to do a pull-up a pull-up workout. So we're all at the bar, whole class is there. He jumps up and he's hanging there, shirt off in his UDT shorts. He's got a dive belt on, probably 20 pounds worth of weight around his waist. And he gets the first group, okay, mount the bar. They mount the bar, we do 10 pull-ups, right, slow. This isn't a up and down, up and down. This uh, is up, hold it. He's looking around. Okay, down. And that's how he does. Okay, first group, get off the bar. Second group, mount the bar. He does it for four groups, bro. He doesn't come down one time. Wow. I'm like, wow. this dude is an animal. Yeah, that's crazy. Animal. Just incredible. And so that's how, I mean, those dudes, and I found this out later when I got to the team, those guys train intensely to be a first phase buds instructor because that's what they're, they, they literally strike fear into the, into the new trainees mm-hmm. through that stuff. They see the physical ability of the guy and they go, I'm never gonna be that good. Yep, already mind and fucked then him. when the guy walks yeah. over, yeah, <laughs> the mind fuck starts. And then he walks over and he says, you're <laughs> never gonna make it. You should just quit now. And then the guy goes, okay. And oh, you're like, my that's I'm all done. that it took? You're like, wow. what? And I was like, well, I think I'll just hang out and see how this goes. Yeah. But I will admit this, day one was the worst. So I, day one happens, we get absolutely destroyed. It was, um, <laughs> it was Buddy Carries up and over the beach or up and over the berm on the beach right behind um, the, the Bud's compound building um, and all day long, all morning, all afternoon. They, it's just Buddy Carries, pays to be a winner, races and stuff like that. I got done, I come back, I'm standing in the shower and back then first phase you're in the compound. So if the instructors have a, they decide they want to come and talk to you. <laughs> You're there for extracurricular activities, oh, right? Oh yeah. So there's always some extra PT that ends up happening in those events. Um, and so uh, anyway, day one happens. We're done with the day. I'm back in the barracks. I'm standing there, and now it's a it's an open bay bathroom shower area, right? So I'm standing there, and I want to cry because it's that fucking bad. But there's other dudes around, so you're like, fuck you can't cry because there's other fucking people here. But I'm like, <laughs> you're not crying. Man, this was really, really bad and I want to go home. <laughs> and then I just got mad because I heard what my dad said. You're never gonna make it. And then I said, you know what? I'd rather fucking die here than ever hear that again. Yeah. And then at that moment, everything changed for me. Hmm. Then it was I wasn't worried about how bad it was gonna hurt. And then you learn some things about yourself, you know, about um, giving an effort when an effort's required. You know, I did a group, I had a group of guys I was training for a period of time. And if any of them are listening to this, they're going to laugh. Mm. Um, they showed up, it was four 30 in the morning and I, we're at the SWAT hangar and we're doing a, the first evolutions of one mile run. And I said, okay, fellas, what's the time on the run? Six minutes coach. Okay. Six minutes. Here we go. Three, two, one set, go. They take off. Boom. They come back. It's like six ten, six fifteen, six twenty, six thirty. 30, you know, and they're coming across the line. I'm like, okay, cool. Grab some water. Okay, back on the line. They're so like, uh, what? And I'm like, oh, well, we didn't get the first evolution right. We can't go to round two until we get the first thing right. And then they learned that when you're given directions, give the effort required to accomplish the task, right? At 610, you failed, yeah. right? And it means something. If I tell you six minutes, I want less than six minutes. And so we ran, we ran that evolution like five or six times that day. At, after the first run, you had already given so much of an effort that there was no way you were ever gonna pass the time. Yeah. And it taught him a very valuable lesson. And from that point, whenever I said, this is what the evolution is, they gave the effort required to accomplish the task. Right? I like that. Because in BUDS, it works like this. 
the time run is X. You know, you got, let's say it's 20 minutes for a, for a three mile time run or 22 minutes or 24 minutes or whatever it is. The coach or the, 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 the instructor is gonna give you the time. They're gonna say three, two, one, set, go, and the, and the watch starts. If you come anything over that time, it's a fail. And depending on the size of the group and some of your interaction and what they think of you because they're watching you all of the time, you might just be done. Wow. All it takes is one thing and you're fucking done. You fail to run, you're out. We've got 180 guys to choose from. I don't need you. You're not gonna give the effort required. I don't have time to waste on you. So learning that early for people, I think is very important, especially young people. Like if you're given a task, complete the task to the, to the specified details. And it worked out good. So I learned that um, in phase one. But could you, could you not pass the time, but be well liked, them see something positive in you and you still stay? No. Oh, so, so time, what, that's or, it. Or maybe it a it's a, to do it's it a timed again. evolution, but what, what might happen is this. They have a phase board. So if you fail an evolution, whether it's a run, a swim, or whatever, if you fail any evolution, you go to what's called the phase board. They will have the instructors in there along with the, with the, with the, the chief, and they'll make a determination of whether they want to keep you or not, whether they're going to waste their time, right? And I've made some phone calls in the past for people, and I've asked, you know, for people to be given a second chance to be able to go out and prove that they can, that they can do it. Mm -hmm. But if you go back out there and you fail the run again, you're done. Yeah. That's it. There will be no, no quarter. You might get a second opportunity, but you're really asking a lot from those instructors. Cause like I said, if 200 guys show yeah, up, it makes sense. why would they waste their time? Now, yeah. when they're down to the last 10 dudes, maybe they go, eh, this guy working out pretty well. He's got an injury that he's nursing okay, let's let him heal up. We'll make him do the time run or the timed evolution or whatever that evolution is. We'll let him do it over at a later date, right? That might work because of an injury or something. But through buds, everyone's injured all the time. I mean, your yeah. body is gonna get destroyed. And I think most guys would tell you after you graduate buds, it probably takes your body about a year to heal from all of this shit you go through. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, I have, I, in fact, I have got a permanent, <laughs> permanent mark on my ass from doing <laughs> sit-ups on the grinder, um, oh, shit. on the concrete in the grinder at the buds, at the buds compound. Wow, That's man. how many, and there was one guy, he was, um, it was, a he was a senior chief, chief, senior chief McCarthy. So I was in class 172. He comes out, walks up on the podium. He says, all right, men, we're going to do sit-ups. We're going to do class sit-ups. So we're going to do 172 sit-ups. He sits there and he's doing sit-ups and he's just fucking reading the paper like it's nothing. No Flipping the page. And you want to talk about intimidating. <laughs> like, you know, the first 20, you're like, okay, I'm cool. And then about 30 or 40, you're like, okay, this is in bed. 50, 60, you're like, dude, this is starting to hurt. At 100, you're like, oh my God, my stomach's going to explode. And this dude just sitting there like, no big deal. Just reading the paper. What number are we on? Oh, you guys don't know? Starting over. Zero. Start oh, again. Shit. Oh, and you're man. just like, are you serious? And it just very intimidating, very intimidating. But you know they do it for a reason, and yeah. it works. But wow. it builds a lot of resiliency of of guys, and and that's really what needs to happen. Is you know they're looking for people who are going to work together and step out of themselves to help their teammates, rather than fucking somebody who's going to be an individual. Yeah. So we had one guy um, when we got to Hell Week, he had been an individual, and they identified that. And when we were in Hell Week, he didn't make it. And it was kind of interesting because we went to a place called Camp Surf. Um, so they build this fire and they got this little wall of sand around and they have you laying on it just, just close enough to where you think you feel the heat, but you don't. <laughs> um, it's a mind fuck there on that deal. But so they called him out and um, they called him out and he never came back. And I was like, they ate him. Oh, <laughs> they man. killed him. And, and you're already like three, four days without any sleep. So then the shit just starts making sense in your head. Like oh, yeah. they really ate him, you know? Yeah. And yeah, then you start hallucinating and seeing stuff. Like we were on a long paddle on one of those stretches um, and they call it around the world and we're paddling along and you look over and I thought I saw people swimming in the water that weren't there. And he's like guys <laughs> falling out of the boat. We had one of the, um, one of the officers, Wyman Howard, um, who goes on to be a, a commander at uh, Dev Group um, or the CEO at Dev Group. Amazing dude, great leader. But he, um, he's, he's the, the officer in charge of our boat crew. So he's in the back and he's the coxswain. So he's driving the, steering the, 
the, the boat. So we're paddling along and then you just hear splash and you look back, he had fallen asleep and fell out oh, of the boat. Shit. <laughs> oh my God. Right on the water. And then it happened again. You're like, dude, stay in the boat. Stay in the boat. It's too much work to get you back in. But it was, it was crazy. That, wow. did, that, did that help your graveyard careers? <laughs> your times on, on graveyard? Graveyard like, was absolutely, well, that's why I started to, to consume large amounts of coffee. Yeah. I wasn't, even in the teams, I wasn't a coffee drinker. Um, I was a drinker, but not a coffee drinker. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's, that's one of those, that's the spicy side of the career that, you know, sometimes when you're a young person, you're very easily influenced in that direction. And, um, you know, quite honestly, uh, t in today's world, it's not tolerated, you know, even, even for those guys, if you get into an alcohol related incident, it, it's probably going to be a career ender. And, you know, even in law enforcement, the, the forgiveness isn't there anymore yeah. of, okay, I understand you're under a lot of stress. Maybe you went and had something to drink and you shouldn't have been driving, especially now with Uber and Lyft and all that. You just go, okay, come on guy. You yeah. really don't have an excuse, but yeah, those are career enders now that, you know, back when I was a young guy, you know, we would go do stupid shit and there were really, as long as you didn't caught, get, didn't get caught, there was no ramifications, but, um, so anyway, I did that. I, I was I was at the teams for six years. I was at Team Five. Um, in fact, we're having a forty year reunion on the first. Okay. No um, yeah. So I I just saw a blurb on that, and I was like, I called my wife, and I was like, Hey, we got to get tickets to go to San Diego. They're having a forty year reunion for SEAL Team Five. I got to get to that. Um, that's cool. Yeah. There's yeah, some yeah. dudes I'm gonna see that I haven't seen in a long time. Yeah, that's cool. Because. And it's interesting when you get, and this is the hardest part about transitioning out of the military. So any military guys listening, they'll recognize this. When you're operational at that op tempo and, and with those group of guys, and then all of a sudden you get out of the military, those guys, well, you know, the next op came in or the next training evolution came in, they, they gotta go. But you're not there anymore. And so you're missing that connection of the team and those guys. And then that's the part that I really found hard the transition was extremely hard dealing with going from active duty military to being a civilian. Mm -hmm. Because on the civilian side, they say, hey, be here for this interview at 10 o'clock. You're there at 9.45 and they show up at 10.30. <laughs> and, and you're like, what the hell? <clears throat> yeah. And they're like, I don't care, it's my time. And you're like, oh, is that how this works? Yeah. You know? yeah. But you know, if, the, if, if you're the guy running the company, I guess you can do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, it was a real different in that aspect, that transition back and forth, but I, I always missed that. And then that's what really pushed me to get on the SWAT team. So I got hired by the Sheriff's Department San Diego. Um, I was doing that. Um, I talked to a guy, um, Rick Skoglin. He was a lieutenant for the SWAT team in, in San Diego. Um, there was a gassing incident that happened in Oceanside. And hmm. so anyway, he got transferred to yeah. where I was working at. and. He had talked, I talked to him about it and he said, listen, the truth is it's going to take you at least 10 years to get on our SWAT team. That's if you do the, do your jail time, do your patrol time. And then you test. That's if you make it on the first test. Right. Most of the time it's a test or two. So you can kind of feel out the process before you make it. And so he goes, you're looking literally to be in your early forties. He goes, how long are you going to be operational at 40 something years old? And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. So he recommended either I go to LA or Vegas. I tested for both. And LA was actually in San Diego doing their background investigation on me. Like I had talked to the interview or to the background investigator and Vegas called said, hey, we want to offer you a job. Okay. Said, I'll take it. Yeah. You know, cause I didn't want to deal with the traffic in LA. And I will say this looking back, big picture. I love Vegas SWAT. I love Vegas. It's an amazing town. But when you look at assets and you look at training things that LA SWAT gets to do. They've got aerial platform stuff that they get to do. They're doing, they got water ops. They've got so much stuff that they're doing. It's literally like their own, like LA's own special operations unit. And it's incredible the stuff that they get to do and the training and the people that they get to do the training with. Yeah. I look back now and I go, it probably would have been a better deal to go to LA, but Vegas called me and I didn't want to deal with the traffic. So yeah. I'm happy, I'm happy. How, how old were you when you went to Vegas PD? Um, I was 30, it's like 30, 31 years old. So you did six years in the Navy and then you went. Got yeah, out I did six years. So I got out, I got out when I was 26 years old. Um, I had my captain's license. So I went back to running sport fishing boats and dive boats. Um, I did that for a while. Um, 
it's good in the summertime, but in the wintertime, you're starving. So um, I got on with the sheriff's department in San Diego, and I, I was doing that. Um, and then when I got that offer in Vegas, I, I jumped on it. I did five years patrol time in Vegas. Um, I was actually, uh, they had what's called a problem solving unit. So it's like a plain clothes detective position, but you're not technically a detective. It's like training to become a detective. Yeah. Um, but the, you get a lot of courses and a lot of classes, you know, teaching search, search warrant preparation and all of those things. Um, because if you're going to test for a SWAT team, it's important for you to understand, you know, what's required in a search warrant. Because if you're the SWAT, whoever the SWAT team leader is or the assistant team leader, they're going to have to read every one of those warrants to make sure there's probable cause and all of those things we need in order to execute a search warrant. Just because a judge signed it doesn't automatically mean you get to go serve that warrant. Mm. There's been plenty of times our agency and even me where I've looked at somebody's warrant and I've read it and I said, mm, this is an unwitting third party residence. We're probably not going to do this. You may want to take the dude off from a different location or something because you really run a risk if you run a search warrant on an unwitting third party's residence. You know, I'm surprised that a judge would even sign it, but it, these things happen. Um, so, you know, having those classes helps build that foundation of what you needed. And then you go back to just, I, 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 it's been an unbelievable ride for me. So in this plain clothes detective position that I had, um, they were having a lot of commercial bur burglaries in the area I was working in. So I said, how are we gonna solve the problem? And I said, hey, you know what? Why don't we set up like a dummy office location? It looks like a regular business office. And we'll put some computers in there. We'll turn the lights on and then we'll freaking wire the place up. We'll put a tracking device inside the computer. And then when they break in the windows, we'll track it right to where they're at. Smart. And sure as shit, that's exactly what happened. So now I'm doing telephonic search warrants for these tracking devices, which, you know, was through part of our construction theft unit, they have these tracking devices they'd put in different types, types of things. So they'd put it in a computer. Our technic, our TAS, our technical and analytical section wired the place for sound and video. So I got anyone and everyone walking by, breaking the glass, coming in. So I've got them inside with the property. So, you know, a burglary charge is gonna stick 100%. You got a good felony charge on someone and depending on their history, it worked out really well. Well, the best part of it was I got a lot of FaceTime with SWAT because they were doing telephonic search warrant after telephonic search warrant. They're like, dude, this is some cool shit. They let you do that? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. they didn't tell me no. Yeah. So <laughs> hell yeah, you know? <laughs> and then I was talking to a guy, um, I love him, SEAL Team 4 guy, Adrian Crandall. He was, uh, he was on our department, he was a search and rescue guy. And it was interesting. So he was sitting there talking to a guy by the name of Gavin Vesp, um, another super great guy. Never got a chance to work with him, always did. Um, just one of those guys you look at and you go, this would be a really good dude to work with because I could learn a lot from the guy. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, him and Adrian Crown were having a conversation one day and I was, I was there as an officer, not on the team. And I had heard the conversation. Uh, they were talking a little loud. Um, and so, <laughs> we get into this conversation. Oh, you're a SEAL team guy. And I was like, Oh, I was a SEAL team guy. What SEAL team were you at? And so we start this conversation and then we develop a friendship, uh, me and Adrian. And then, so then I'm talking to some of the guys and they're like, Oh, okay, this dude's a former SEAL team guy. So that, that now that helps you. I mean, that lends you a little credibility for sure. Yeah. It works for you sometimes and against you. And I'll say this, there have been guys who've gone before who have left a bad taste in people's mouth because they're far too cocky and they overestimate their ability and they want to make everyone change what it is they're doing instead of just going to the team, assimilating and adapting and, and performing at a high level and then promote change through performance rather than your words. Yeah. Wow. And so because guys have gone before and they've been real vocal, it puts a bad taste in people's mouth. Like, oh, these fucking guys are really cocky. Yeah. You know, they're arrogant assholes. And I fucking hate that because I'm trying to fight that stereotype. Oh, always has been. You know, I put my pants on one leg at a time like anyone else. There's nothing special about Charles Mosier. I'm just a dude who got blessed to be in several different places. And for whatever reason, God likes his knuckle dragon barbarians because he's been really good to me. <laughs> and uh, it's been great. So I got to do that job. I um, got a lot of training. And then um, there was another guy, big instrumental part of my career was a guy by the name of Jim Dixon. So Jim Dixon was a SWAT sergeant for a long period of time, had lots of cred with all the old school guys like a guy by the name of Pate Kazi. I worked with him, legend, Metro SWAT legend. Um, 
uh, Bob Montez, Bob Lewis, like these are like the old school guys who set that foundation. Well, I got to work with those dudes when I first got there. And I'll tell you, I got, I get excited even thinking back on it, like, dude, how did I get to work with these freaking dudes? Cause you want to talk about top level operators. These dudes would, they're, they're so sharp in how they think and observe and look at situations that even with all that SEAL team experience that I brought in, you're looking at at how to peel an orange from a different from a different perspective. Yeah. It's still an orange and it's gonna get peeled, but it's a completely different perspective and it's a lot cleaner and you go, wow, yeah, this is probably how it should be done. And all their stuff was vetted through fire. So if they ever had somebody who they got into a shooting and one of their guys got shot or they shot someone, they always stopped and analyzed how did this happen and how could it be prevented? Because we don't go there to shoot or hurt or kill anyone. Mm. Unfortunately, it's part of what ends up happening when people want to fight us. They want to hurt us and kill us. They force us to do something, but we're not there to do that. And so we always analyze those situations to say, how can we minimize the level of force that we have to use? And how can we inspire them or, or, or talk them into, into giving up? Because you don't get, it's like I tell people when I hear people talking about officers and fights and, and shootings that happen on the street. Well, if you read the law, there's no place in the law in any state that I've ever been to that says that you're allowed to fight the police on the side of the street because you don't agree with what they're telling you. Mm -hmm. That's why we have a courtroom. So if you decide to fight with the police on the street, bad shit happens to you because all their, all their buddies are gonna come or all those other officers are gonna come and they're gonna try to help out because they don't know the details of what's happening. They just know that a fellow officer's in trouble. They're trying to help, right? So um, in that, you know, you, you look at all these shootings and stuff that we were analyzing, everything that we were doing was because someone had gotten hurt or injured or shot. And so everything was vetted. So you would hear th theoretical things about, well, we do it this way or we do it that way. And, you know, like the old, you blow the door and run to the bathroom. Yeah. Well, that stopped because cops were getting shot over dope. And they're like, mm, let's not do that. Or we were shooting people over dope. And it's like, well, what kind of narcotics investigation did you do? You know, do you have the guy solid? Like you can make an arrest um, based on the information you already have from your investigation, or are you hinging everything on the fact that he has the dope on his person when we, when we do the search warrant? And so with the way we started to do what we were doing um, when I was on the team, um, it made the officers and other details be better at their jobs because we required more from them. If you showed up with a search warrant that said Lanou Fanu, you know, last name unknown, first name unknown, you know, am I gonna risk a life of one of my guys to go dynamic on that hit? No, no, I don't know who's in there. What if, did you run the plate in the driver, in the, in the parking lot or in the, in the space assigned to that apartment or even that house in the driveway? What, did you do a power check? What did you do on your end as an investigator? Right. And that's where you go back to that previous job. I got to do those things in that plain clothes detail. So I understood how the investigation should go. So when I was reading search warrants and I'm not reading the stuff that I need to read, I'm like, bro, I go, here's, we can do this one of two ways. I'll give you your search warrant back. You can either decide to go back and, and fill in those gaps for me and I'll be glad to go dynamic or we just do a surround call out. And if you get the dope, you get the dope. If you don't, you don't, it's that simple. But you know, they would want guys to go dynamic on a, on a marijuana grow. You're like, for what? <laughs> yeah. They're not flushing the plants, bro. Yeah, <laughs> They're yeah. there. Yeah. So um, some of this stuff was kind of crazy, but um, over time, <laughs> the tactics, you know, were all reinforced through things that had gone on. Um, but I was blessed to work there with a lot of really cool guys. Got to do a lot of very high intense, uh, high intensity type of ops where, you know, there are hostage rescues where there's women, there's children, there's people on a bus. You know, there's, it's no joke. And, you know, some people don't realize the intensity of that. Yeah. And, and even as an operator, when you're 30, 40 years old, you're just ready for the next stop. Yeah. And you don't even let that soak in. And then one day a lady came to the hangar and she had been taken hostage by a serial rapist. And we end up going in and some operational things didn't go well. But we end up having to, we blew some portholes in the wall. Um, he pulls a lady on top of him um, and one of our guys goes in and, and ends up having to kill him. Um, but she comes to the hangar and the only hostage that had ever come to the hangar and thanked us. And it was her, her husband and her kid. 
you want to talk about an emotional moment wow. in a dude's career because you normally you never come in contact with yeah, that person outside of in. the intensity of the situation. You go in bah, bah, and you see it and you're like, oh shit, there it is. Wham. And you take the shot. Dude goes down. You grab the hostage, take him out. One person's on the suspect, you know, and then you never see him again. So when she comes in the hangar and then you see this is a family and you were you were instrumental in her still being here because yeah. he had murdered other people. Wow. And you just go, wow, dude. And so that was the only one that ever came in there, but all I ever needed was one. Because after that, I was like, it has, it makes no difference whatever happens in my career at this point. I was here for that one operation and that mattered. It wow. mattered because it saved her life. That's and awesome. then that kid's, that kid's mom's gonna be there. And then the, the guy was, you know, that's where he gets even more emotional for you because imagine a dude crying, hugging you because you saved him, you saved his wife. Yeah. You're like, that's pretty intense. That's powerful. Yeah. yeah, it's good stuff. That's pretty cool. But that's why SWAT dudes do the job, Yeah, you yeah. know, to protect people, so. Yeah, it takes a certain individual, I mean, for certain guys or gals to, to want to do that job to even be on a team, you know? Uh, so you ended up, so you get on the SWAT team, um, and uh, at what point did you get on the sniper team and how did, you, how did that work out and what was the uh, training? Yeah, what's the process on that, that small team? So I'll, first I'll go through the process just to even get on this, get on our yeah, team. Yeah, let's, let's hit on that. So we have a department of about 4,000 officers. And like I said, you got somewhere between maybe 30 and 40 operators. And of those guys, Vegas SWAT and some other SWAT details, um, generally you'll have a group of guys, at least half, maybe three quarters of them are there for the, till the end of their career. Like you'll go there and the camaraderie and that close, that close relationship that a lot of us like um, is there. So you don't wanna leave. Yeah. You don't wanna give that up. And I, I was never gonna give that up after, after I'd been there. I was like, dude, this is what I was missing from leaving the SEAL teams. And I found it again in these, in these guys. You know, even to this day, I just talked to a guy, Joe Susich. He, um, great dude. He retired um, not too long ago. He called me up and I was like, bro, we gotta go get a coffee. I and mean, it's just, you develop such tight relationships, you don't wanna leave. Yeah. So to get there worked like this. So back then you would do, um, they would have a qualification shoot. So on the qualification shoot, it was very intimidating and they did it purposely. So as you're shooting the qual, there's a SWAT officer standing behind each candidate, right? Can you perform under pressure? Mm -hmm. And that's as simple as it is. You would be amazed at the number of people who really freaked out Yo, because yeah. the people are watching, another. like everyone's watching you. Yeah. And another thing that ends up happening that they don't think about or guys don't think about is when you're on the SWAT team and you're out on a range and you're teaching a class, they don't go, well, hey, listen, um, I understand that you know, you're not comfortable talking in front of people, so we won't have you teach. It's not how it works. They go, it's your turn. Get in there and freaking, you know, you're gonna teach this, this, and this. Yeah. And so, you know, being a firearms instructor is one of those things that just about every guy on the team's a firearms instructor. Um, but so first would be the qualification shoot. So you'd shoot the qual and as long as you pass the qual, you're on to the next thing, which is physical fitness test. Back then it was an obstacle course and it was a very simple obstacle course, but it was long and the time was short. <laughs> oh. And it had, it, it had strategically placed some, some walls to where your body is already physically taxed and now you've got to climb over a wall, mm. right? And then there's the tunnel and some tire stuff. Now the way they switched it is, it's still an obstacle course, but you'll start off at the corner of our range. You'll run up, up the stairs on the outside of our, of our two-story training building. There's a dummy drag on the inside, and I want to say it's like a 200-pound dummy. You drag them from one end of the building to the other and then back, and they have lines where you got to cross the line. Um, you'll set him down. Um, you'll go down the stairs, and now this is with a gas mask, the first part of it. So you got a gas mask on, you run up the stairs to the drag, you go down the stairs on the inside of the house, you come out of the house, you run across to the range. When you're on the range, you'll do, um, you'll do a, a Mozambique drill. Um, so you'll have, um, or El Presidente. So you'll have three targets, two to the chest, one to the head on all of those. Um, now, one of the things is you can only load nine rounds in a magazine because once the shoot's done, they don't want you running with a loaded firearm, mm. right? And I get it. I mean, even though they're officers and they're running with a loaded firearm every day, it's a controlled environment yeah. and they're doing it for training purposes. So, 
that's another attention to detail kind of thing. So they're watching to see that you get slide lock and then watching you perform your, your mag changes and things like that. And then you get your slide lock back again. Um, if not, then now guys have questions, right? Yeah. And they're not going to let you run off the range with, with that firearm. But anyway, so you'll do that. You'll do that drill. Then you'll run over to the tower. There's a, about a 10 foot window. You got to jump, climb through the window, go down the stairs on the backside, run across the range to um, what they call the atom room. You'll climb through the window. Uh, you'll run to the corner. There's a, there's a heavier dummy drag that you'll drag from the corner to the door. And then the smart thing is to reposition the dummy because you have to drag it back when you come back. So um, once you reposition the dummy, there's um, like agility tires. You'll hit the agility tires. There's a low wall. You jump over the low wall, pick up the shield. You'll run the shield up to an armored vehicle. Um, at the armored vehicle, you'll put the shield down. Um, you'll pick up a ram. You'll run around a building with the ram, bring the ram back, set it down, pick up the shield, take the shield back to the low wall put the shield down, go up and over the low wall, back through the <laughs> agility <on>. tires. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. yeah it's, it's quite the event. Um, back through the agility tires and then drag the dummy back into the corner, reposition it, and then out the door into the finish line. Now, the average time on the team is somewhere probably right around five minutes. Total time that they give you for that evolution is six. Um, but if you, on your shoot, so, if your rounds aren't in the scoring box, they're marking time off. Oh, so right. it's 10 seconds. Yeah. So you're like, oh shit, you better make sure you're a good shooter. So it's just a time thing. So, um, but it's one of those things where there are guys that we were training with or we were, that would come out there, they would run it and they would run it in like, you know, four minutes, just over four minutes. And we had an incident where one guy had run it super fast, like 4.10 or 4.15 or something. I don't remember what his time was, but he gets to the finish line and collapses. And so we had two different trains of thought on that. Like dudes are like, this is terrible. You can't do that. You still have to get here and be able to fight. And I'm like, I understand your point. Here's what I want to say about this guy. What he just showed me is he's willing to give me everything he's got. Yeah. That's who I want on my team. And they're like, hmm. I didn't think of that. Yeah. And that's the effort that I want to see. I want to see how much, because if you're a great athlete and it doesn't tax you in any way, shape or form. Okay. Well, what happens when the adversity comes? Yeah. I want to see you under pressure when there's adversity before I say, yeah, that's my guy. I want to see you under pressure when shit really sucks and see how you react to it. Because I certainly don't want some guy who's just going to lose it. Right. Because you have to maintain control at all times. Yeah. I'm out on a, on a call where maybe the guy's done some unspeakable shit to some other person, like a kid or something, right? You can't let your emotions get involved in that. You have to shut that off and be like, I can't go in there and do what I want to do. Yeah. I got to go in there. I have a job to do and I have to perform that job at the highest level possible, yeah. which means I have to take this dude into custody and I have to put a plan together that forces him into custody because he's not going to go willingly, right? And so that's a thing where you can't have people who haven't faced any adversity or I don't like to have guys who've never faced adversity come into the team because you don't know how they're going to react. Yeah. Makes so I mean, total sense. And then the, the, the key component to our testing process is, so you get through those two things. Um, they actually added a, um, a body weight bench press to that, um, along with some push ups, um, sit ups, um, pull ups with a, with a vest on, um, and those kind of things. But even at that, it's more like a pass or fail. The whole process hinges on your ability to speak and to articulate um, to the three person panel. So you have two sergeants and the lieutenant and they're going to give you scenario questions and they don't expect you to answer the questions as a SWAT officer, but they're going to want you to, to, to know everything that you should be doing or that you should do as a patrol officer. Like if I'm showing up on a barricade, what should I be doing? How should I be doing those kind of things? You know, contain it. Did we get containment up front and back? Did we see the suspect inside? Like all of those things you're gonna have to be able to articulate. Um, you don't have to tell them what SWAT's gonna do when they get there because they don't expect that you know that because yeah. you didn't go to SWAT school, right? right? We'll give you that information when, when you get to a SWAT school. Now they did change it. Um, some years ago, they started allowing guys who would come out and volunteer for our unit. So they would volunteer their own time to role play for us, which helps out tremendously. Oh, yeah. um, especially when you're practicing hostage rescue on a bus, you need 60 people. 
you need 60 role players. So it, you have a very real dynamic yeah. that's happening in the bus, self evacuations and things like that. Like the, the um, Kevin, Kevin McCord would talk to the role players and he would give jobs to role players to do certain things. So we get as most realistic training out of it that we're going to, because you know, if you're dealing with um, someone who's just sitting there. You, um, you can check that if you need to. No. Um, <laughs> if, you're, if you're dealing with role players who just sit there and they don't do anything, that's not real. Yeah. That's not real. Right. The minute that somebody comes on there and there's anything, people will self-evacuate because self-preservation takes over. You know, just like you hear people talking about, well, if there's a, if there's an active shooter, you know, I got to worry about shooting in this giant crowd and all this. Well, guess what happens when the person starts shooting? Yeah, Everyone runs. Running. So guess what? Now he's isolated by himself. That's generally what happens. Self-preservation takes over and everyone runs away. Um, that's a smart response. Um, so, you know, um, with that kind of stuff, they start asking those questions. How do you handle this situation? How do you handle that situation? Um, then they start asking even interpersonal relationship things. Like, okay, so you're, you're, uh, we bring you to the team, you're hanging out and, you know, the guys are hanging out and, you know, we get a call out, you show up to the call out and one of your teammates shows up drunk. What are you gonna do? You know, they'll ask yeah. you those questions. What's your integrity like? You know, are you gonna have some integrity? Um, or how are you going to handle it? Are you going to go straight to the to the SWAT commander and throw somebody under the bus? Or are you going to go to the team leader and let him handle it? I mean, there's appropriate levels of interaction. Yeah. Or, or are you the kind of person who just says, hey, listen, bro, I think you should go talk to freaking the team leader or whoever that is, you know, for us. Hey, I, I need you to go talk to Pate, bro. Like, no, no, I, I'm drunk. I can't. No, listen, you're not hearing me. Yeah, give him that. I need you to go talk to Pete. Okay, I don't want to talk to him. I need you to go talk to Pete. And give that person the opportunity to go, hey, listen, I was at home on my own time and I had a few drinks. I don't know that I should be in that entry stick, you know, or I should even be on the call, things like that. It gives them yeah. an opportunity to fall on the sword. We want to hear that kind of stuff before we hear, oh, I'll call an IAB and I'm going to do like, you know, like, yeah. okay, we don't want that guy on the team, yeah. you know, because that's going to create a lot of internal problems because do people make mistakes? They do. Yeah. Every one of us is human. We put our pants on one leg at a time. I can't tell you the, num the amount of shit that I screwed up in life that more than I got right. I've got a couple things right. Thank the Lord. But I've screwed up. If it's if there's something to screw up, I've screwed it up. Trust me. <laughs> if there's a way to mess it up, it's been me. Well, yeah. <laughs> So yeah. you, uh, we talked earlier, like you've been involved in uh, several officer involved shootings as, as a member of the SWAT team. Um, are those uh, incidents you can, you can share with us uh, kind of how those, some of those unfolded and what your, what was your role at the time? Sure. Um, so um, once I got to the team, I was on the team. Um, I got to the team in 2006 and um at that time, we had a transition from a lot of the older guys were starting to retire out, and um, the newer guys, my my age, my my tenure, were coming in. So me, Mark Linebarger, and and um, Dwayne Farron, uh, all great dudes. Um, in fact, I just saw Dwayne not too long ago. Great guy. So if Dwayne, you're listening, love you, brother. Shout out, shout <laughs> um, out to Dwayne. Yep, shout out to you, brother. Um, he's still still doing it, still in the trenches. And I was oh, like, wow. man, you're glutton for punishment. <laughs> you know, yeah. hardcore dude. Um, but anyway, so we got to the team, um, in and we got to the team in May. In December of that year, a couple of the snipers um, were retiring or transferring out. Um, when that happened, um, Dwayne and I both, and so some people aren't going to agree with the process, but the process is a process. Doesn't matter where you're at. So some agencies, you know, they say, they go to the senior guys first. Hey, do you want this particular position? Do you want to fill that role? And they'll either say yes or no. And then it just kind of works its way down. If you're the last man at the end of the, Hey, I don't care whether you like it or not. I need you to fill this role because yeah. I need this job done. Right. And that's kind of how it worked. So we were, we were both new uh, to the team, Dwayne and I. Um, and so they're like, Hey, listen, um, nobody else wants a job. So it's yours. And I just have a problem with, I don't want to be average. I, I don't want to suck. And always in the back of my mind, I have a complex about, you know, there are other people who are better than me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always working to be the best that I can be no matter what it is I'm doing. And so in that, in that role, it's like, 
you know, you you start to adopt um, what's going on and, and what the team's asking you to do. But back then, there was a lot of things that would go on on callouts that if you're not a sniper, you're not really thinking about. So sniper shows up on a call, you know, more so than worrying about trigger time, the first thing you need to be concerned about is where's the fortification of the structure? Where are the cameras at? What's the door made out of? What's the structure made out of? I need to get all of that information back to the entry team as they're landing. So if it is a hostage rescue and it goes critical, my guy grabbing his breaching charges from the truck already knows what charge he needs to get in. He doesn't have to get up there and take a look. I already told him what the door is, the door swing, all of it. So if it goes crisis right from the minute, right from the right from Jump Street, they're on it. They know what's up. So. I used to, I used to try to get there before anyone. And so when they were setting up this communicator system, it calls certain numbers in order. And I was like, bro, I gotta be at the top of the list. <laughs> so I was probably number two or number three in the call out list. And so I would always get there first. And the way we would do it back then is when you land on target, you would deploy as a sniper. Um, and a lot of times the action normally is happening at the front door. So anyone who's listening, who's outside of law enforcement, I don't wanna say a whole lot about that part, but a lot of stuff happens at the front door. So you need to get a position um, as a sniper to cover wherever the action's gonna occur at, um, and then give that critical information that's happening on the structure. So the first role is information gathering. So you get there and you get as much intel as you can on even stage locations. You might show up and the staging location it, the suspect can look out the front window and see the trucks arriving. Yeah, yeah. That's not good. It happened to us down, so there was a shooting I was involved in down at the Gene Airport. Um, and so it's very, on the very south end of town. Um, it's probably about 20 minute drive from Las Vegas. And so uh, as you're headed towards the California border, it's a drop zone. So what had happened was there was a guy in the truck. Um, he had an RV. He was a, rec a retired corrections officer out of Florida. Um, had moved and retired to um, Mesquite, Nevada. Um, I don't know if he was off his medication or something like that, but if I remember correctly, I think he was taking medication, hadn't taken his medication in a while, and then the voices started, and then the longer you're off medication, just further the, the psychosis goes, and he just goes off this cliff. And so there were a couple run-ins with law enforcement prior to the call out where we ended up going, um, where Officers had interaction with the guy. There wasn't anything you could arrest him for because being being crazy isn't isn't Illegal. against the law, yeah. you know. And so, you know, there are plenty of people who have issues, you know, who may even talk to a therapist who you would never even know, right? Does that mean that you know we start stripping them of stripping them of their rights? You can't do that, you know. So, um, he has those two interactions where he says stuff about you know the the satellites flying overhead, which would give you cause for concern. Yeah, like, yeah. okay, yeah. this guy's out there. Um, so he finally ends up on the drop zone down in Gene, Arizona. Or, oh, I'm sorry, Gene, Nevada. And um, the drop zone crew come out to have him leave. Well, when they go up there, he comes out with a weapon, makes some threats to them. And then um, they call the department, they call 911. Um, an officer shows up out there, officer attorney, great dude. Um, he was working this resident area. Um, so he gets out there. Um, he tries to engage the guy from his from his B, PA on his vehicle at from a distance because of the gun issue. Um, the guy comes out with a gun. Um, attorney says, it's some kind of a long gun. I'm like, okay, cool. So I get there. Um, or he threatens to shoot anyone or shoot any police that he sees. Um, so Turney backs off, he calls for the SWAT team, we show up there. And the interesting thing is this, and so I'll give you the human perspective. So I'm in the car wash with my kids in the car, having a great time when the call comes, right? So in your mind, you're in a different spot mentally. Yeah. And, you know, I'm in dad mode mm -hmm. with three kids who are probably, you know, two, two, four, and five, uh, or three, four, and five, or something like that. And we're having fun in the car wash, and then it's boop, 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 and I'm like, oh shit, I am, I'm nowhere near the house. My wife is, act, <laughs> she's, she was actually working as a recruiter at the time frame, so she's across town, on the north end of town, with, the, with, uh, with work as a recruiter. And I'm like, I'm gonna be the last one there. This is freaking terrible, right? Yeah. I'm like, oh no, this is not good. So I call her, I shoot, I meet her at Tropicana and the, 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 the 95, which is right there in the center of town. 
And then here I am, I got my lights on on the truck and people are looking and here I am my, with my SWAT <laughs> uniform on. I got car seats with kids in them, putting them in her car, strapping them in. I'm like, I gotta go. So <laughs> I take off and I get down there. It turns out I'm the second person to arrive. Joe Susage is already on site. Um, I'm the first sniper to arrive. So I get there, I talk to, I talk to Turney. He tells me um, what he saw. Um, the, the vehicle, the RV is facing away from me, but the side door is open and you can see a bunch of trash and stuff that he had thrown out of the vehicle um, on the ground. Um, so I grab my kit and I set my vehicle up. As a sniper, everything is pre, pre-planned and pre-prepared for operational stuff. So I'm 30 seconds, I got all my shit and I'm ready to go. So I got my, I throw my ghillie top on, throw my ghillie veil, um, grab my rifle, and my, I got a chest rig that I wear that's got my range finder, binos, and, and a Kestrel in it. Um, so I throw my shit on. Um, I take a look with the binos, and I can see that the, the door is open, propped open, but the glass has been shot out. Hmm. So now I'm like, okay, we've already got some shots fired here. Yep. Um, so now it raises the level. Now, one thing I have learned over time is that when the front door is open, that means they're waiting for you. Mm-hmm. Right. There's no fear because you guys know this from doing operations. When you blow the front door off, what happens? 99.9% of the time they give up. The security blanket is, is blown. Yeah. Right. So they don't feel secure. So when doors are open, it's an automatic, oh shit, this is not going to go well. So instantly I see that the window's been shot out. I'm like, okay, that's bad. That's really bad. So I start moving into a position um, and it's a desert area. Now, the backdrop behind me is I-15 going to LA. Now, on a Sunday, and this is a Sunday morning, from literally about nine or 10 o'clock in the morning until about six o'clock in the afternoon, there's stop and go traffic all through there. And it's probably traveling about two miles an hour. I mean, it's nuts. And so there's all that traffic stuck on the highway and then you've got all these SWAT trucks rolling up. And of course, what's everyone doing? Slowing down even more. What's oh, going yeah, on? They they see what's yeah, up. they're all looking to see what's going on. So that's that's the suspect's backdrop. If he decides to shoot, that's where he's shooting at. So as I start to move into position, um, I get out. I'm like 100 and something yards away. Um, I got my, my ghillie stuff on, so I'm, I'm blended pretty well. I get set up. I can see the guy inside the, inside the RV. He's got his back up against the front seat, sitting in the middle just watching the officers arrive. And I can see the guys getting more and more escalated because I can see him yelling there, the veins in his neck are sticking out. You know, you got a 24, 25 powered optic. It's like you're standing right next to the guy. I mean, you can see a lot of shit. Um, So he's in there, he's getting escalated. And I'm like, okay, Um, we get some information that he might, he, he had made mention of a bomb. So now we don't know if there's a bomb inside this vehicle or not. So we can't let it get mobile, right? So the first rule of SWAT sheet is keep it contained. Mm -hmm. Don't let it get mobile. So I get another, one of the other snipers when he arrives, I said, hey, listen, I need you at about the 11 o'clock position off this vehicle. Um, so if he gets in the driver's seat to drive away, you're gonna have to end it, right? We can't let him get mobile. It, it, there may be a bomb in there. Um, and so Jesse Wiggins is moving to that position. Um, Cyprian Arkillian is gonna move into about a two o'clock position, which will be kind of moving up a ravine, probably about 50 yards away from where the, from where the, the ravine's at. Oh, I'm sorry, where the, where the RV is at. And so he's moving up this ravine. And sure enough, at that point, the guy decides that's it. It's time to fight. He'd seen enough people arrive. So he jumps out. He has a, a black long gun, looks like an SKS. And he grabs the charging handle on the side hmm. and charges the gun. Hmm. And at that point, yeah. you know, I have no other choice because and as the max effective range of an SKS is 400 meters, yeah. right? So these are things that snipers should know so you can articulate why you're shooting. You know, if it's, you know, even a handgun, at the distance he was from the highway, all those people's lives are in danger. So yeah. even if he had a handgun, you're gonna have to do something. So when he charged the charged weapon system, he showed me his intent. I fired one round, struck him in the right temple, and that was the end of it. Um, now there are some things that end up happening um, afterwards that a lot of times we don't talk about. So an example, he goes down, somebody's gotta go up and and clear the vehicle. So the team moves up, TACMATIC moves up with him. Well, up until that point, we hadn't had a sniper shooting in an extremely long period of time. Um, And so the TACMATIC pulls the guy's body um, off to the side and they start working on him. Okay, well, his face is no longer there. I mean, it, a 308 yeah, hitting yeah. with 2,600 foot pounds of energy, 2,500 foot pounds of energy at 100 yards, we're just it's horrifying what you see. Yeah. And so not only that, 
my teammates go up and they're clearing the place. And one of the guys, um, great dude, he goes, bro, that was fucking horrid. That was unbelievable. I've never seen any shit like that ever. And it leaves a mark, right? Mm -hmm. So now is that brick number one in the shit that you've seen or is that brick 15 or 20? Yeah. Because at some point that brick wall is going to get really fucking high. And if it gets hop heavy and it falls over, you're going to have a problem. Mm -hmm. And if it does fall over, that's when people's careers end. That's where people's lives are destroyed. Like guy can't deal with the shit anymore because it's not the first bad thing that you see. Yep. It just, it's accumulative over time. Yeah. And it's not the first dead kid. It's not the fifth. I can't tell you. It's different for different people. For me, a guide called and asked for some help on a, on a DUI scene. I get there and there's a dead woman and her child laying in the street. And I just lost my shit. Yeah. And I realized, wow, dude, you've got some anger management issues going on. <laughs> yeah. And then when you're emotionally out of control like that, I, it, I had to go to my car and call my wife. And I sat in my car and people were like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? And I was just like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, okay, now I'm feeling and I'm going through what a lot of people I've heard talk about with kind of, it's not when you're in the moment of combat or, or the shooting, yeah. that's not when it happens. Yeah. It's these other things that trigger and then you have this moment. So I had my moment and I said, oh shit, you better, you gotta take a look at this. Um, so then I started, I started talking to a guy. Um, so that shooting had happened and then some years later is when that car accident happened. I mean, there was several shootings that occurred while I was there. So um, I'd been involved in four shootings, um, all as a sniper. Um, you know, I always looked at the job from this perspective. Um, I'm there to provide intel, but more importantly, my job is to make sure that the entry team is safe. Mm -hmm. And I took that job very, very um, seriously. I would go to work two hours early to train because I took it that serious. I stopped watching sports when I went to the SWAT team in 2006. I don't go on Sunday, I, don't, I didn't go watch football. People would be like, what are you doing? I'm at the range training. Training what? Uh, well, I'm shooting my rifles, I'm shooting my handguns, I'm making sure that I'm on. Because it works like this. You can go from a hero to a zero in one call. Yeah, right no out. yes. You show up on a call and you know we had an incident where we had a newer guy, less experienced, in a spot by himself, a lady starts shooting and he has to shoot. Luckily there were other snipers on scene, but he shoots and it's not good. He ends up shooting the wall. And you just go, man, in a career, you may only be in one of those scenarios. Yeah. And that's, now imagine living with that. You know, you're like, yeah, it's hard. fuck, a failure. Yeah. You know, it's hard when your moment to shine is a failure. And that's what I always feared, was my moment to shine would come and I would fail. And so I would train all the time. I'd be up there running in the freaking desert, 115 freaking degrees. People are looking at you like you're fucking nuts because you got a plate carrier on. You're like, yeah, man, let's do this. You know, they're like, this guy's got problems. I go, I know, I talk to a guy every week, you know, yeah. but I'm still here doing it. But that's how serious I took it. And and even to this day, when I'm, I'm talking to guys, I get upset, you know, and you know, I, I come to, to teach a class and I just start asking questions. How many guys know how to do this? Nobody raises their hand. And you're like, okay, I know somebody in here has got to know how to do that because if not, we're missing the, we're, we're missing the mark as, as operators. You know, it, we just had three guys escape from a prison here not too long ago in New York, right? You would think that every sniper across the state is now man tracking certified, right? Because that's a skill set that you should probably yeah. have in your toolbox. If some look what happened now, right down right now, they have three guys I think broke out of a of a prison in Louisiana, and the marshals are going to be on it. But the dudes in the bush, those three guys were up here in New York State, in the bush, making their way towards the freaking uh, towards the state line. You can either be the answer to the problem, or you can be a part of the problem. And I always looked at those scenarios and I thought, okay, well, how would I handle that? What skill set do I need to have? Adrian Crandall helped me set up um, a tracking class for our guys because I took it that serious. I'm like, hey, if this shit happens in our neighborhood, we need to be the answer to that problem, bro. Mm -hmm. And now deserts um, are different for tracking than they are in the woods because you don't have as much deadfall. Like in the woods, it changes. You gotta look for different levels of sign because 
you know, when you have all that deadfall, you got leaves and all that stuff, it's gonna yeah. obscure footprints and those kind of things. But you gotta have the training, right? And then you gotta train on it continuously, picking locks and those kind of things. There's skill sets that you should have as a sniper. It's most people and a lot of younger people who get into the craft, they look at, it's just shooting. Shooting's a very small percentage of what you do. Yeah. You know, and they forget about the intel. They forget about all of that other stuff. And I always looked at the other stuff like I wanted to be a complete operator. So when somebody said, you know, hey, uh, we've got a guy who needs to take a shot. I want them to say, I want it to be Charles Mosier. Mm -hmm. I never, like I was telling you guys, I could care less about being the sergeant or the lieutenant or anyone else. I wanted to be the best operator on the team. Mm -hmm. That's how I looked at it. And I, that's how I wanted my teammates to see me. It's like, if I'm out there and there's one guy I get to pick to do overwatch to, to, to shoot past me or to shoot over my shoulder, I want it to be Charles Mosier. And that was the feedback I would get from my teammates. And, you know, Joe would tell me, he's like, dude, whenever I hear your, your voice on the radio, I get this sense of peace or calm come over me because I know that nothing's gonna happen. You're not gonna let shit happen to anybody until we end up in the house and then it's a 50 50 crapshoot yeah. and so you know i sometimes i i get real passionate about that side of the job because i still in my mind i guess i'm still 25. yeah well <laughs> you know yeah, still we, trying to do it we do you know we do, do these classes too and like yeah you you'll ask some guys questions or whatever and maybe some people just don't want to raise their hand and fucking answer i don't know but like it is a little frustrating when you know it's like guys come on like this isn't fucking wells fargo like you 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 don't show up at eight and leave at five. Like this job is, is a life and death job and you don't know when that call is going to happen. It could be, man, it could be fucking tomorrow. It could be today. It could be never, it could be never in your whole 30, 20 year career. But dude, like you choose a job to where like, you got to be ready for that call. Like whatever it is and whatever capacity that you work in law enforcement. And I, I, I get frustrated too. You know, I, you see cops that go off and do different things, you know, different assignments and they just let like, their standard like uh of tactics and knowledge and just go down the tubes you know it's just i don't know to me it's frustrating yeah um, I, I think you got to maintain it all the time so. extremely frustrating i i left swat i went to south central area command and i got there and we were still back in the days of teaching a three-man um uh, response to active shooter and i said listen that's never going to happen when are you going to get three people you don't drive with three people in the car, you're in a car by yourself. You gotta be an army of one. Yeah. You've gotta be confident in your skills, abilities, and talents to get in there and get after it. Mm -hmm. You can't be afraid, you gotta go. You know, you can't wait at the car. Those guys in, in, in Nashville, a great example of that. Yeah. You just gotta go. Yep. Yeah. Because if you look at the statistics, statistically speaking, when they get confronted by law enforcement, 95% of the time they kill themselves. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's a win. You didn't have to pull the trigger, so you're not gonna be out of work for any period of time, but he stopped murdering people. Now you're in the scene, so then we go back to things that we should know as, as officers. Now your ballistic trauma class that you got that you thought was worthless, now you're putting all those skills, abilities, and talents to work, saving some kid. Yeah. You know, yeah. And that's when it's really gonna hit you. I would, and I used to bring this up all the time. Guys would be wearing vests and all these things, and I'm like, how much, how much med kit do you have on you? And they're like, well, I've got a tourniquet. I'm like, that works good for you. Yeah. And I would say, here's your scenario. Shooting happens at the school, you're there, and there's four or five kids, you shoot the suspect, great, you did a great job, he's down, you don't have to worry about it. But there's a couple of kids laying around you who are bleeding to death, and you have nothing on you. I said, trust me, from experience, you will wake up every night thinking about that, that you watch that kid bleed to death in front of you. Frightening to me. So I carry, I carry blowout kits everywhere I go. I got one in my backpack, I carry one in my car, one under my seat, I got one, in, I got one everywhere. Um, yeah, and it's just from that, that aspect. You yeah. think about that stuff and you analyze that stuff and you wanna be the best and you wanna be prepared and there's a lot of people that And it comes with don't. the experience though. So, yeah. Know, the, the experience yeah. that you've gotten in, in life yeah. and in the military and in this career, like that's why you do those things, you know? And that's why we do this is to, to share this information so that people listening to this hear that and don't have to wait for something bad to happen and for them to get their shit together. Like do it before something bad happens, you know? Yeah, be prepared for it, especially yeah. mentally. You know, mentally is another part of it. Uh, there, are, I think there are a lot of people in law enforcement today who aren't prepared for the confrontation. No, not at all. And so you see it, um, they're, they're, 
they're non-confrontational people and they took a career that requires confrontation. Yeah. You know, you stop someone on the side of the road for a ticket, you know, that person, you may catch them at just the wrong time. Yeah. And the person's like, I'm just not having it today. Yeah. And you know, you're like, okay, listen, this isn't the courtroom. You don't get to decide how this is going to go. I'm going to write you a citation. And then the guy gets out and then it's on. Mm -hmm. And now it's a fight for your life. Yeah. And it started off with the most mundane thing that a lot of times cops kind of take for granted is that car stop. Yeah. In my opinion, I always thought that's the most dangerous thing you do. You don't know totally. what's in there. You don't know where the guy's coming from. You don't yeah. know what he did. And as soon as the lights go on, what's the suspect think? They got me. Yeah, they exactly. know. And you're like, fuck, I had no idea what's going on in that car. Yeah. Well, what, what you said was really interesting because I look back at when I was an officer and some of this stuff and trying to figure out why some of these cops are so timid and they're, they're not, they, they don't engage or they're scared. And I mean, you just, I mean, I wish I would have heard a long time ago. You summed it up. They're, they're non-confrontational people in a confrontational job. And yes. people, a lot of people don't recognize that. Well, I think the reality too, a part of that is like, I think a lot of cops get in this job thinking it's never going to happen to them. And, and I'll like, I'll be honest. I, I you know, I'll, I tell, tell it in the, in a class I do is like, dude, I was a 20, 20 year old kid who got hired to be a cop. I think that's like way too young to be a cop, but nonetheless, there I am. And, um, uh, my first shooting I was in, I was, I was young. I was in my mid twenties and I thought I was one of those guys. I was like, yeah, it probably won't happen to me. And then next thing I know I'm in a gunfight and that totally changed the trajectory of like my career, how I thought about things, how I thought about the job, how unprepared I really was mentally. Um, and how the lack of like mental training that we actually get, <clears throat> but how crucially important it is. Um, and when I share that story, like one of the guys on scene for that, that was there with me, uh, never fired his gun and, and I never turned and I never saw him. I don't even know where he went. Um, you know, and he shut down. So well, that's the importance of it's crazy of training and yeah. you have to seek that on your own. I think that's why like being here, yeah. like TAC ops is amazing. Savage training group is amazing. Like you have yeah. to seek out these training groups yeah. and do more. You said you stopped watching sports and you took it upon yourself to do extra training because people relied on you. Yeah. We need to have that mindset. Everyone has got to have that mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And like, that's really what needs to happen in law enforcement across the board. Mindset shift. Totally. Because yes. if totally. It, what you're talking about, guys think it's never going to happen. Uvalde, Texas. Yeah. You know, it's very unfortunate that what happened there. Everybody but, says, but we none didn't of think those, it happened. Yeah. Here. None of those yeah. guys were prepared. And I'll tell you right now, I didn't hire up to go commit suicide, but I would exchange my life trying to save a hostage or to save one of those kids. Gladly. I've been a protector my whole life. If that cost me my life doing that, okay, that's what I signed up for. But I'm never gonna stand back and allow that to happen around me. But it's a mindset. It's just a mindset and I'm always prepared. When I go to the mall, I can't tell you the number of people that I've talked to who are in law enforcement, they go places, they don't take their firearm. I'm like, you're a cop, dude. You have a higher level of training. And the general public has an expectation of what you're going to do or what you should do. And even though agencies, a lot of agencies say, listen, if you're off duty, we don't want you to get involved. Well, I understand that if it's just a normal dispute, yeah. two people arguing or whatever. But somebody pulls out a firearm and starts threatening other people or starts killing other people, you have the training. Get involved. Stop it. Don't yeah. let that happen around you. And if that's your mindset, you're always thinking... Okay, if this happens, what? What if? What if this happens, then what? And I always work in that mindset. I go places, I park where I park for reasons, you know? I, you never park right in front of the front door. I mean, that's just kind of silly. I don't, even, I've got a handicap placard on my freaking car. I don't park in the handicap spot in the front, you know? I have it and that's fine, but then, you know, I pulled in there and I thought to myself, if something fucking happens here, my car's right in front of that, you know, my getaway vehicle is right here in the front. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be true. parked right there. I'm in the wrong spot. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I need to be somewhere where they can't see the car. So I try to park off somewhere. And then imagine if I'm out at the mall and the shooting happens and I have to take action. I'm there with my family. Well, my family comes first, period. So I get them out. I make my wife carry a firearm everywhere she goes to. So I can say, babe, take the kids to the car. Who knows where the car's at? She does, and the kids, no one else. So I don't have to worry about the mysterious guy gonna get them when they come out. I can direct them out to an area where there is no shooting. I know they're gonna be safe, and I just tell them, wait for my call. Because my son, who's 17 years old, knows what's gonna happen when the call comes. He's gonna come to me with my med kit. 
right? Because I carry that med kit in the car for a reason. If something fucking happens, I can probably save at least five, maybe six, seven people through tourniquets, chest seals, and quick clot, you know? And that just comes to, like you said, experience and training. But I'm thinking in my mind of what if this shit happens around me? And now the benefit of that is simply this. I'm prepared, my kids are prepared, my wife is prepared. Because we're prepared, what do you think's gonna happen? It's not gonna happen around us. Mm -hmm. Murphy only shows up to he, yeah, who, he who's unprepared. Shit happens around people that when they're not prepared for it, yeah. right? Or they that's think true. it's never gonna happen to yeah. me. You know how many people try to fight with me on the street? And now, if you're seeing this, you may think I'm a bigger guy. I'm not a bigger guy. I weigh I know, about Charles 205 good, pounds, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, but I'm not a big guy. And I've dealt with dudes who were hardcore, you know, ex-felons out of California, but it's all in presentation, how you control the situation. I had a guy who was thinking, jaywalking. So I stop him, I'm like, hey bro, step on over here. I go, hey, you know the deal. I said, you know, uh, I engage him in a little conversation. I start talking to the guy and I can tell by his demeanor, something's wrong. I'm like, okay, do you have anything on you you're not supposed to have? And he starts to move towards his waistband. I said, sir, don't do that. You're gonna escalate a situation that doesn't need to escalate. I said, I don't wanna have to put my hands on you, but if you start reaching in your pants, I'm gonna have to put my hands on you. So we had this little conversation real quick and it goes pretty well. At no point in the conversation, the guy told me this afterwards, he goes, you know what? At no point in our conversation did I think that I could have gone for my gun and that you, that you wouldn't have shot me, that I would have been able to get you. He goes, from the time you stopped me till the time I was in handcuffs in the back of the car because I was an ex-felon in possession of the firearm, at no point did I think that I had you. And I was like, huh, yeah, that's kind of good to know. Yeah, yeah. Said, but it's controlling the situation. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and that's a, a, a young guy, 20 years old, 20, 21, 22, 23 years old, even up until they're 30, they show up on a call where, you know, you're seeing a guy on his worst day, maybe he's had a, a, a fight with the wife, things have kind of gone sideways, and he's a much older guy, so you don't wanna step on his toes, but you kind of need to, right? Because you have to take control. And that's the thing that doesn't get, doesn't get relayed real well to younger officers, mm -hmm. is they expect you to take control. And if you don't take control, you open a doorway where somebody thinks that they might be able to get one over on you or they might be able to do something to you. And you'd never wanna open that doorway or even have them have that thought like, you know what, this guy isn't even paying attention. You know, and some of it's just how you look. You show up and you see a guy who looks like he's in shape, nobody really wants to fight with that guy. No. But they see the big guy who shows up and he's freaking, looks like, like he slot, can't run yeah. past the front of the car. They're like, ah, I got this guy all day, Oh yeah. you know? And so it changes the mindset of the, of the suspect as well. And, but mindset shift is really everything. Yeah. And the more that you, you're engaged and you're like what they call in the now, you're in the moment, um, none of that bad stuff's gonna happen to you or around you because you're in control. Yeah. But you know, if you're an officer and you're hearing this podcast and, and you leave the house without your firearm, I'm gonna tell you a story that happened to me. And that's why I carry a gun everywhere I go now. So I was working for the Sheriff's Department in San Diego. Um, my son was, I think, three or four years old. He's, or maybe he was five years old. Um, but he's going to the speech therapist at the school. So um, one day I'm at the house, and at the time I was working at the Central Booking Facility in San Diego. So when you work for the Sheriff's Department in California, you start off in the jail. Yep. So you're gonna do five years jail time, then you go to patrol school, then you do five years uh, patrol time, then you can test for SWAT. So um, I'm doing my jail time, I'm at the house, my wife says, hey, I need you to go pick up Taylor. I'm like, all right, cool. So I get to the car and I realize, oh shit, I don't have my gun. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to the school, right? No big deal. I'm gonna run in, I'll get him, I'll be back out. So I walk into the school, I get my son, we're walking back out. I'm like, so how was it, buddy? And he's like, oh, you know, dad, da, 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 and he's talking to me. And I'm holding his hand, and then I, from behind me, I hear, I hear a male voice say, hey, Dep, which is short for deputy. Yeah. And now I'm like, Oh shit, like the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I'm standing in a school with my kid, mm. unprepared for any kind of encounter, and here's a dude that clearly knows who I am and yeah. I don't recognize him. And now, you know, in law enforcement, sometimes you end up having to use force on people. Mm. Now, I don't like to touch other people because I don't like to be touched. And I used to explain that to be like, I don't want to have to touch you, dude, so don't make me touch you. Yes. Yeah. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like it either. Don't make me do that shit. Yeah. And so, <laughs> You know, and a lot of times it would be like that. People, it's kind of a joking statement, but it's serious at the same time. And so, anyway, 
I don't know if this is a person that I use force with or not, you know? And I turn around and I'm pushing my son behind me and I'm ready to go into attack mode. And the dude's like, hey, I just wanna let you know I'm doing really good since I got out of jail. I really appreciate the conversation, you know? Cause I always would tell guys like, you know, just because you committed a crime today doesn't mean that's the end of the world. Yeah. That's not the end of it for you, bro. Our system works like this. You serve your time and it's over with. Get out, learn your lesson, put yourself to good use, you know, in our community, become a productive member of society and no, no hard feelings. Like, okay, you screwed up. Yeah. We all make mistakes, yeah. but that doesn't define who you are as a person. And when people start telling people who've made those mistakes, especially if it's a felony, yeah. Guy gets convicted of a felony. It's like, oh shit, my life's over. Now I'm just a shit bag and you know, I get to live this other kind of life. And you go, no, you have a choice. There are plenty of guys who've been to jail for felonies and now they're millionaires walking around in LA. Yeah. Right? They yeah. do something, they get into a movie somehow. Next thing you know, the dude's making millions of dollars and you go, damn, I would have never thought. Yeah. You know, there is redemption if you've made a mistake. But they don't hear that because all the system tells them is you're a piece of shit. Yeah, you're a failure. And we know you're a piece of shit and we're going to keep our thumb on you for the rest of your life. And so anyway, I was never one of those people. In fact, there were many times, even in SWAT, you know, dude sitting on the bumper and I'm like, bro, this is a wake up call. And they're like, what do you mean? I go, I'm here for a reason, right? This is your wake up call. The next time this may not go so good. Right now you yeah. surrendered, you're going to go to jail and it's going to be what it is. But that doesn't have to define your life. You can change it. The decision is yours to make. And afterwards, people would tell me, dude, I really appreciate that. And I'm like, hey, I'm just being honest. I'm just telling you how I see it. You know, I don't have anything against anybody. I got a role to play. I got a job to do. Yeah, we're pretty big. So. We talk a lot about that on this show. Like we do try to preach to these guys, you know, that listen to this, like treat people with respect. Yeah. It doesn't matter. However you come across somebody, doesn't matter what they've done, treat them with respect. Uh, I'm very big on that and how you talk to people out on the street. Um, yes. You know, and I was that young fucking punk cop, you know, that treated people like shit, but I didn't have any mentors to tell me otherwise, you know, I kind of had to learn on my own, but over time, you know, you start to see the value in what you're talking about right now. And I mean, so I wish um, you'd treat me better, Kyle. Oh, well, that's, a, that's <laughs> another story, dude. It's like a, it's a, it's like a marriage. <laughs> God, yeah. I'm abused. Well, I'm, we might have to ask Charles after this to be our counselor, our marriage therapist. Yeah. Um, hey, listen, we <laughs> could be That's here. a deep dive. Yeah. That is a deep dive into that relationship. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that you don't want to hear. Um, <laughs> hey, listen, dude, we could be here all day. Fuck, you're, you're an awesome guy. I, I love surrounding myself with guys like you. We we had a guy, Mike uh, Malpass, on our show from Phoenix Squad, and he's, he said this. He says, uh, you know, he's, he's just like you, man. And he goes when it was fourth and one, I want the ball. And, and dude, I just like, that shit resonates with me because I love surrounding myself with people like that. Cause those are the type of people that make you better. Um, so we're going to wrap this up and, uh, thank you so much for sitting down and taking the time. I know you're busy here at the conference to sit down with us, chat with us. Um, uh, we've had some cool sidebar conversations. Um, I'm glad to have met you and, uh, Hopefully, I think all the listeners that listen or, or are watching this are going to gain a shit ton from just listening to you. Well, I really appreciate you guys' time. Thanks for having me on. Um, I'll say one last thing. So on that, even to this day, I still seek out training from people that I admire and respect. So do you guys know who Robert Vogel is? Uh, no. Okay. So Vogel Dynamics, the dude's like a several-time world champion handgun shooter, <laughs> you know. Um, Taron Butler, you know, uh, he's the guy who did a lot of stuff with a lot of actors in LA teaching them firearm shit. Like I seek out those people for training. Yeah. And because even to this day, I'm 54, my, am I going to be on another tactical team somewhere? No, probably not. I mean, at this age I'm retired, but I still have that. I still want to be the best. So when I'm training guys, younger guys, the information I'm offering isn't old and outdated and go, oh, we don't ever do that anymore. Yeah. You just go, no, these are gunfighter skills and this is what gunfighters do and this is how we tackle that thing. And even though I'm a sniper instructor, I teach everything from basic handgun up to, a, it to, up to competition shooting stuff, you know? And handguns, rifles, doesn't matter. I mean, I'm a firearm instructor. I just love that shit. So I seek out those guys like that. So that's cool that, you know, you're talking about that, especially like it, 
for people who may be new in their career, find a mentor, uh, a mentor yeah. in your organization, or even contact these guys and, and reach out and say, Hey, listen, I'm a new cop and I don't really know what's going on. And, and I hear the stuff you guys are doing. You go into these tack ops shows and all this kind of stuff, you know, reach out and talk to them and, and ask about the types of training that goes on here because it will make you a better operator and then make you a safer police officer. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I mean, for sure. Charles, you're a stud. Thanks for yeah. taking the time to be here. You've had a great career. Thank you for yeah. sharing some of that. I've taken quite a few things from you, especially I loved your quote when you said, I only have one speed, it's go. That's how my philosophy is, but you've been awesome. I know a lot of our listeners are gonna take great value from this, so thank you. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for your time, guys. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Super awesome. Appreciate time. for your time. All right, everyone. We're here at the TAC Ops Conference. This is an amazing place. Uh, Badass instructors yeah. like Charles at these, so <laughs> dude. Yeah. I'm not kidding. Go to swatconference.org. Get signed up if you guys can. Uh, there's still, you guys can still attend the Nashville and the DC um, conferences uh, later this year. So, all right, that wraps it up. Go check us out, shotsfirepodcast.org. Get subscribed to our website, do free giveaways, um, and we'll catch you guys on the next show. Later. Yeah.